Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's Sean from All Things EV, and I'm back again talking about something that I think is extremely fundamental to the electric vehicle industry, which is raw materials. This is going to be a theme over the next videos you'll see here on the channel. Make sure you're subscribed if you're not. I'm diving extremely deep into what's going to make this electric vehicle transition possible. On today's episode, I've got RK Equities, Howard Klein and Rodney Hooper back on the channel. I had them on the channel a couple of years ago around Battery Day to talk about how significant Battery Day was, but I'm bringing them back on because as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some really fundamental things happening in the raw materials industry and I can't think of a better group to have back on than RK Equities, Howard and Rodney, welcome back. Thanks, Sean, for having us back. Yes, absolutely. So um, you advise uh, raw material companies. Uh, you also have a YouTube channel called Rockstock. It's a, it, you, you go into far more detail than I could ever. It's a really great channel. Um, I'll make sure and link that in the, in the description, but one of the things that, that caused me to reach out to you, Howard, was a video uh, centered around your prediction, your educated guess on where you think the next uh, Gigafact, Tesla Gigafactory will be, and uh, I think that that's probably a good place to start, but... Um, Talk a little bit about that video, and then I think we can unfold and unpack some of the key points, as well as some of the things that we've been talking about since you published that video. Okay, thanks. Uh, that was, uh, I guess, two or three videos ago. We started Rockstock Channel um, actually around this time two years ago, just ahead of Battery Day, and I was reminiscing about it yesterday um, when we rang the bell at Piedmont Lithium as this time two years ago, like I knew that that was coming, and, uh, and then it was announced. And all the hype during the pandemic and, you know, that stock traded, you know, two billion you know, dollars worth in that in that one day. Uh, but but we we launched the channel then, which was an outgrowth of a podcast that, you know, an audio podcast that we had started in 2019, which was an outgrowth of a newsletter I started called the Lithium Bull in, uh, you know, 2016 time frame. And we've been looking at lithium companies um, and lithium battery metals companies for you know, 12, 13 years. And, uh, but everything we've been talking about is now kind of conventional you know, wisdom. I think I reached out to you, Sean, three years ago because you were one of the first YouTubers uh, who kind of like cottoned on to, you know, why is Elon saying he might have to get into mining, right? You know, that was like three years ago. And, um, and you, you have seen more than most, uh, you know, the criticality of this. So I, prior to that video on Canada, I, our most popular video is me speculating that if, you know, Elon and Tesla as part of Master Plan 3 were to buy Albemarle, the biggest lithium company in the world, it would be game over because it, you know, he would have the two best assets. He's, he's trying to persuade people to get into the lithium industry but if you were to buy the best assets and the best company in the industry, he would have a long-term sustainable advantage because he would have super low cost, uh, you know, and 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 um, you know, raw materials. So especially lithium, the, the the most critical ingredient. The you know, my speculation on Tesla Canada was in part because you know he was in Canada, or there were rumors about it being in Canada, and uh, uh, Canada has taken a lot of steps um, in the midstream and the upstream of the supply chain. So if you take, um, you know, a battery, sorry, the cars at the end and then batteries, you know, and then cathodes, uh, you know, and then chemicals and then mines. Um, in Quebec and Ontario, they have been building cathode plants, a lot of announcements of cathode plants, you know, and chemical processing companies. So companies like BASF, POSCO of Korea, um, you know, Echo Pro, Ford, uh, uh, or Ford and Echo Pro have been have been talking about a, a joint venture, but um, forgetting who else who, Namask and Livent um, and uh, Umicore. You know, a few companies have announced multi-billion-dollar investments in Canada, and then uh, Elon joked at the AGM that he's half Canadian um, on his mother's side, and uh, you know, he's talked a lot about localized 
supply chain. So if you could be close, you know, from a, a manufacturing efficiency perspective and from a sustainability perspective, if you could have, uh, you know, battery and car making very close to cathode and mine, uh, you know, mining, and it's not just lithium, they have cobalt and they have nickel in Canada. Uh, and also ge geographic proximity to, um, you know, the northeastern and midwestern states in the U.S. It's a very big population center there. So when he moved, uh, well, when he opened up, um, you know, Austin, or uh, that's well served to do this southeastern you know, part of the United States. But it was important for him to have something more east because from Fremont, to the east coast you know the eastern united states have most of the population so i think population access to population matters a lot but since um i've been digging deeper into this inflation reduction act and uh, another friend of yours and a friend of ours uh, just did a video jordan disagi with bradford ferguson who has dug i've dug into the details on the mining and metal side uh, they've dug into the details kind of on the battery and EV side. So I think they're talking about a $35 per kilowatt hour credit, you know, per battery. So they're in the investment tax credits, you know, and various supply side incentives. I think this Inflation Reduction Act has been underhyped. A lot of people have focused on, uh, you know, oh, the EV subsidies are too hard to meet. And, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and the and, and but uh, you know, Tesla right now is at their 200,000 threshold. So they weren't going to, they could now sell an unlimited amount. They could also, they're also going to benefit from the subsidy for heavy trucks. So like the, the, the semis uh, are going to get a $40,000 um, tax uh, credit, but the, the Tesla doesn't have a demand problem. It, it's interesting. A few years ago, people were debating on, in Congress, you know, why are we subsidizing EVs? Nobody wants them. Now the argument is, why are we subsidizing EVs? Everybody wants them, right? So w where the problem is, is um, on the supply side. Uh, and th there are very significant amounts of money. I just did a, a panel uh, at Minds of Money. We'll, I'm going to release a video with four uh, projects, including you know, Talon Metals and, and Piedmont, you know, Tesla, future Tesla suppliers, where we talk about hundreds of billions of dollars that are being um, applied and it's for clean energy across the board but metals and mining extractive industries have been um uh you know the, the, these, these credits that, that have been for wind and solar and geothermal have been expanded to include you know the processing of raw materials so that combined with incentives for battery and ev making is making me think right unless canada passes a very similarly generous subsidy for um these uh these plants you know you might see um tesla building you know maybe in michigan or minnesota or, or ohio a midwestern state where it's still close to the canadian raw materials but if it's if it's clearly an economic decision based on um you, you, you know cost this this investment tax credit and subsidies built into the inflation reduction act I mean, is meant to level the playing field with China and the way they subsidize a lot of their economy. And, and so I'm tempering my enthusiasm for the Canada uh, option based on my understanding uh, of or my evolving understanding of these uh, incentives that will apply to Tesla and all, you know, Ford and GM, all these companies will benefit from that. So we're about to experience a major renaissance in America, you know, we're, we're really like we've woken up and we're surpassing, you know, Europe, in my opinion, um, in terms of industrial policy, uh, you know, American style. Yeah, I think this is a an opportunity for America to become energy independent. There's a lot of dependence currently on foreign oil. And this is this is an opportunity to pivot uh, away from from foreign oil to developing uh, raw material, raw material mines. I, I guess one of my thoughts as you're talking about that, Howard, is, you know, a gigafactory is what will produce around 2 million vehicles, I believe Elon has stated in the past. 2 million vehicles per gigafactory, I mean, there, 
quite frankly, there's 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 enough gigafactory, there's enough demand for vehicles uh, on an annual basis to have a gigafactory in both places. My question is, does does Tesla gain anything by having local localized Canadian uh, production? Uh, do they get access to tax benefits if they have a Canadian uh, located gigafactory? I mean, there's. I, I'd love for either of you to to unpack unpack the significance of of Canada in terms of raw materials. You've got a far better overview of uh, raw material mines in Canada. They're they're, they're pretty uh, mineral rich, uh, raw material rich country. So why? I understand why it would be appealing for Tesla to build one in the U.S., but is 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 there a strong case for uh, Tesla to build one in, in Canada? Does it give them access and relationship to to the raw materials located in Canada? Sure. I mean, uh, Sean, that's a great question because the reality is you can still given the relationship between Canada and the U.S., ship the raw materials down to the U.S. So I, I'm not sure from a geographical perspective, from a from a sp supply perspective, if you think about the cleanness of the grid in Quebec and Ontario, and in Ontario, you know, Canada is a great location from a carbon footprint perspective processing. So that's a, a natural and... Um, in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of labor, in terms of uh, carbon footprint. So it's, it naturally is a perfect supplier. If you were to list all of the countries in the world, Canada is right there, up there in terms of suitability as a supplier. You know, in terms of the location, bear in mind that, and people sometimes forget this, it doesn't go from mine to gigafactory you've got to go depending on how it's processed you've got to go from if it's a mineral you've still got to then do the chemical conversion then the chemical conversion has still got to go to cathode and then it goes from cathode to um to the battery cell plant and your anode and what have you's all got to come in so the question is you need all of the pieces of the puzzle now canada is looking at cathode there are there are various initiatives at hand, but if, if you can have mine, converter, cathode, and then cell along with, um, you know, anode and all the rest of it, then uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that in that you are not then further transporting it. But I, I don't think it's insurmountable, an insurmountable issue sending it down to the states, but it just from a from a carbon footprint and from an uh, from an electric cleanness of grid, you know, Canada obviously is, and space and all of those types of things is is a you know very appealing location. Are there any other countries that are this aggressive with policy for clean energy and electric vehicles? This the Inflation Reduction Act, based on what I've learned so far, it seems really big. Is there, are there any other governments around the world that are incentivizing companies to make localized, you know, uh, electric vehicle? Well, there's, there's incentives for purchasing on the consumer side, electric vehicles. That's, that's one piece, but I, I really think the, the, the incentive needs to be a little bit further down. So what other, what other countries are incentivizing companies to, uh, produce the raw materials, battery cells, modules uh, in, in their countries. So Europe has kind of gone the other way. They've, they've kind of gone the stick way rather than the carrot. So you're going to have a, you know, like a carbon passport or what have you, and, and essentially they're going to shut out, you know, elements that, that aren't uh, clean enough or put some kind of a carbon border tax. So they're going to do the stick route. The carrot, of course, is the incentives for the vehicles, which is, is what you've mentioned. I guess, you know, the, the problem that you have is, well, relatively speaking, Europe is not uh, as uh, blessed from a minerals perspective as North America is. And that is, and that makes it a challenge. So 
they're kind of going also the friendly country route or potentially shipping in material and then processing it. But Europe, as you know, is a small continent with a lot of people. A lot of a lot of uh, countries have you know quite a lot of. If you look at someone like Germany, they've got a lot of cities that are pretty big, as opposed to a few big cities and then a lot of open space. So you don't find a lot of open space in Europe. And that makes it tricky for putting chemical plants in or, or putting, you know, the downstream or the upstream for that matter. So um, their preferred route has been the stick. We'll have to see, as Howard said, he thinks the U.S. is now eclipsing it. The U.S. has, you know, the benefit of a lot of space um, and, uh, you know, a workforce, a willing and able workforce that's keen to shift, I guess, versus uh, versus Europe. So we'll we'll see from out from elsewhere. If you look at somewhere like Australia, they're still getting to grips with it. But Australia sees mining and processing as a tax revenue opportunity. You look about you look at how much money they make out of iron ore and coal from exports. They they mint cash, so they've been very loath to incentivize the manufacture of lithium when you've already got a labor shortage in Western Australia with the uh, iron ore mines and so on. So they just see it in a very different way. Um, they have, you know, quite a few incentives on, on solar, I think, but, but on the downstream, you know, Australia is almost the fully employed country. They haven't bent over backwards at all to put anything there. And, and, and that's why you don't really, Tesla says do more on, on the downstream as in process more chemicals because it's a tier one jurisdiction and they'd prefer to see the uplift of, of uh, the conversion of spodumin into a lithium chemical because when you ship it from Australia, when you ship the spodumin concentrate, you're shipping 90 whatever percent of waste to China to then make it their problem. So you can avoid it, and that's why Pilbara, you know, Hard and I just interviewed. They're looking to do, you know, sort of a, a midstream product where you keep a lot of the the waste material at home. So it, it hasn't made it, it hasn't made economic sense to Australia, and they haven't they haven't really tried to incentivize it. So everyone is different. Europe is trying, but you've got European metals and a couple of other deposits, you know. Um, that are there, but they, they don't have a lot of natural natural uh, raw materials, uh, so they're having to do a different route. But America is in a very good position if you look at the size of the country, the availability to put chemical processing and battery cell plants in, as is Canada. It's an enormous country with space to, uh, you know, to, to put, you know, the likes of Beck and Core and what have you up um, and and uh, and have upstream and downstream. Canada, Canada is huge, but not a very big population. And when we think about Canada, uh, I really think it's between Quebec and Ontario, which are the two most populous provinces. And you know, again, they, they border the U.S. on the eastern side, where the population is, you know, in the U.S. But I, I think it's. Um, I think mine and concentrating the chemical, like once you concentrate something through a chemical, if you're shipping like a $50,000 a ton product, right, um, then the shipping costs don't matter that much. Um, and from an environmental point of view, you're not shipping a lot of waste. So I, I think Canada's future is is very much like in, in, in the midstream and the upstream, uh, so up to cathode. Uh, Ontario, it, Quebec doesn't have very much auto industry, and Ontario is where all of um, you know the auto industry is in Canada. So that's why my bet was if it is in Canada, it would be in Ontario. Can they get a cell plant there? Uh, it's possible. Can they get auto manufacturing? It, it, it's possible. I think a hundred percent is going to come down to like the math, right? You know, and and these incentives that are in the Inflation Re Reduction Act may have um, you know tipped it into. Uh, you know, America's favor, unless Canada does something similar. I mean, the, the cost of, you know, there's more labor availability, I think, in the United States than there is in, in Canada, like in, especially in, in certain areas like Beckencore, you mentioned, Rodney, like, like a lot of plants are coming. There's going to be a big demand on labor, you know, and then labor rates will kind of go up. Some of these places are, um, 
some mines are, are kind of like far away. You have to kind of fly in, fly out. And, and Quebec has, you know, kind of European, you know, style, you know, French speaking, you know, rules on labor and it's hard to fire people and the like. So overall cost um, and, and then subsidies w w will will be the determinative factor. I think you can get, you know, proximity to raw materials in America, you know, w with this, you know, um, very close relationship we have with you know with canada i don't think like a plant in australia makes sense because you're shipping cars such a long distance just like you know it doesn't make sense you know indonesia i know has been talked about but that's largely nickel you know there's not a lot of other you know materials out there and then um you know the government in indonesia may try to force you know you're only going to get our nickel if we kind of go you know you go further downstream but I, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. And to your question, China's the only one that subsidizes the industry in any way uh, like this. And Europe, everyone talks about Europe, but Europe's a collection of a lot of different countries. It's not like a European, there, there could be European policies put in place, but there's not a lot of European subsidies. There's some, but not like America can act because it's one country with a lot of people in it. And um, and so this is very significant. It's bipartisan on the national security front, even though it's not so much bipartisan. You do have, um, you know, still your your debates, um, you know, on how green things are uh, or support for EVs and the like. But uh, there's a lot, a lot. There's very few sticks in the Inflation Reduction Act. There's lots and lots of carrots, um, and uh, you know, it's it it's meaningful and and we'll 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 see where it goes um but it's what's important is like tesla uh, beyond this right um there, there's a big competition tesla's very ahead of all of the other companies but ford has had a re has signed a whole bunch of you know memorandums of understanding you know on the uh, raw material side with some big companies like rio tinto and bhp on nickel cobalt um and then some smaller development companies on the lithium side in one case, they've written or are going to write a three hundred million dollar debt check to a development project in Australia, a company called Liontown. But I think this competition that you're seeing, like GM has signed a few agreements, is going to accelerate, and you're going to see uh, these companies starting to write checks. And one of the lithium companies said, "If you own the rock." Um, you're, you're, you're God. If you don't like you're, you're screwed. Right. That was the, the quote of this week. Um, so lithium software margins, like enter the lithium business, you know, mine more nickel, these kind of comments from Elon Musk, I'd like to see it translated into, you know, a 1930s, 40s style Fordlandia where, uh, Ford was owning upstream, you know, iron mines in Minnesota, and rubber plantations in Brazil. I think we're going to get to that point. Um, what has not been so examined, which I think maybe you, Sean, um, and I'd encourage any kind of Tesla YouTuber who focuses on this issue, is that there was a lot of talk two years ago about lithium, and there continues to be talk about lithium. And, and he signed this deal with Piedmont, and then he talked all about clay, and he hasn't talked about clay for two years. Everything that we understand, they haven't really made much progress on that. Um, but they did sign an agreement in nickel with Talon Metals in January. And if you look, if you listen to Battery Day, he spent a lot of time talking about nickel, right? And, and he had said mine more nickel. But it, all the press after Battery Day focused on lithium because he talked about lithium in Nevada and clay and everything. And, and no one was really paying attention to to the nickel. And then in January, when he signed an agreement with, if you read the press release that he signed, that they signed with Talon, it was the most detailed, this is the most significant uh, arrangement with a junior mining company that I've seen. I've read every press release. And if you just listen to the language and Tesla is very secretive and, and hard to negotiate with, and every word in that press release was, um, was negotiated, you know, and they talk about partnership and they talk about it's not just nickel, it's, you know, they're byproducts like cobalt and, and, and iron, you know, for lithium ion phosphate. So I don't think the market properly understands um, that transaction, that budding relationship with Talon and Rodney, you've done more work on this and maybe can augment some of the commentary I just made there. But I think it's a 
it's an area as you dig deeper, Sean, into the raw material side of things. And also you, you tend to have a, a, obviously a very strong um, support and affinity for Tesla to, to understand how far advanced Tesla is, dig deeper into that nickel and iron, you know, arrangement with you know what's happening in town and towns, not just in Minnesota, they just announced, um, you know, a deal in, in Michigan, you know, to acquire, you know, more mineral rights there and explore there. You know, I talk about Elon saying, mine more nickel, you know, with Talon, he's encouraging them to find more nickel. And these are very, you know, right in America. Um, anyway, if you have any further comments on Rodney on, on Talon, I, I really think that's a, an under understood and under hyped, you know, relationship that you could see follow a similar trajectory to a number of the lithium uh, enthusiasm, uh, you know, for that project in particular. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, um, if you look at, at uh, nickel versus lithium and who supplies, you've got Russia, you've got Indonesia, you know, there's more complexities around that. So, you know, when you come down to it, there's quite a few lithium projects in, in, the, in North America. In fact, there's a lot of them. We'll see how all of them play out. They, they, they sum through different processes. But in the end, the only um, high nickel uh, sulfide you know, development project in the U.S. is Talon. There's one project. That's it. There's one operating, and there are low nickel sulfides in Canada, but the only high nickel sulfide development project is Talon. And there's potential for them to do quite a bit more with this latest acquisition. So for someone like Elon, think about it, you know, it's very likely as much as they're pivoting to LFP and a lot of things, it's very likely that the Cybertruck and permutations around that are going to need nickel. And the Cybertruck has got the longest lead order. I think I read somewhere about a million and a half in a pre-order. So he can make those all day and night, I think, and sell them in the US. I think it's going to be a very popular car. So it would be hugely beneficial to have a, again, a tier one close proximity um, a project, you know, in, in the U.S. And, uh, you know, there's also byproducts that Howard uh, spoke of that they could use for, uh, for other things. So I think if you think about it, aside from inventory, logistics, lack of product, if you want to immunize yourself against the risk of trade tariffs or you know, even just, you know, Sean, if you look at it, there are times like um, where Philippines and Indonesia and whatever basically have just said, unless it's being, you know, beneficiated on in country, they ban exports. You, you, there's lots of risk with trade and trade borders aside, from, you know, from COVID and just difficulties, you know, I think ports being shut down or what have you and geopolitics, a lot easier to have a major supplier just around the corner from you where you understand the process and you're the main customer. Because that's another thing is if you look at a lot of the, um, the major lithium suppliers and so on, they don't like to be beholden to one customer, so they like to split their order book. Um, so there's a limit as to which, uh, you know, Tesla can order from Albemarle, Livent, et cetera, whereas Talon, you know, they are, it's not all of it, but they're, they're a major customer, so you, you have that special relationship. But there's a lot of reasons, you know, there's talk of the Indonesian thing, but there's work to do on, um, there's tons of nickel in Indonesia, but there are questions and issues around, you know, it's mostly a coal grid and so on, but I'm, I'm sure they can, improve and do solar and so on, but it's a lot e lot easier to have a small footprint, high grade, small footprint of a mine located close and easy supply where you can work together and and, and make sure your supply chain is as efficient as, as possible, especially um, with something like the Cybertruck and the Semi is another thing. Again, you're going to want the highest energy density for Semi, I guess, because you're hauling Load. Rodney, does does Talon have any estimates on on their nickel supply? 
how many vehicles uh, can be produced with their nickel supply? So they've signed an initial agreement, um, and and that is um, uh, fifteen million kilos. So, well, I, I need to just check, but um, it's not. There's scope for it to grow, but again, uh, if I do the quick maths. Have you got a calculator there? Let's assume that they do 15,000 tons a year. That's 15 million kilos. How many kilos in a Tesla? About 50, is it? It's about 300,000 mm-hmm. Teslas, I think was the initial per annum. But there is scope to, to expand that. And again, that's the point. Uh, and I think that Howard was making is... I don't say, you know, I've, I've read different reports, but, you know, you have production scrappage and so on that comes up. You know, you think about 20 million vehicles by 2030 is just an insane number when you think about it when we are running into raw material uh, caps now at trying to get to 10 million this year for the global market every manufacturer. Is this a problem? It, it- We've got eight years. We've got le- we've got seven and a half. We've got less than seven and a half years to 2030. If you were to put a, a drill into the ground now, you can't discover and, and have a mine built and ramped and producing by, by, by 20. You can't discover a mine now and have it up and running by 2030 if it's all going to do all of the legs. You can do spodumen, send it to China and wherever. So... The urgency is is already upon us. Is that? I think this is mul- a multi-faceted problem. One, investment dollars. More investment dollars are needed to expedite this. But it appears like there's also a policy challenge as well. So uh, more more policy that's friendly to. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act seems like it's a step in the right direction, but. The permitting process, as I understand, is not a fast process in the U.S. So how, how, how does North America solve this problem, expedite things to reach their goals? Well, you've you, hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> you're going to see um, uh, so Manchin um, got a promise from Pelosi and Schumer uh, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act to get some permitting reform. He has a one pager out there as to what he is shooting for. Uh, By the end of September, we're going to have a result here because it's being tied to a continuing resolution to fund the government in the U.S. So either we get a if we get no deal, then there's a government shutdown, you know, and then we get it. So the sausage making of American legislative process is going to continue up until kind of September 30th. I've been impressed with Manchin's. Um, political skill uh, thus far, um, but there's not everything. Yeah, you know, there's a lot to like in this in this bill um, as it pertains to uh, supply side incentives. But you know, the, the, what's interesting is that they all of the funding support is to every step of a, of a flow sheet from like a mine to you know getting a chemical. So if it's lithium or nickel. They will provide funding for every step except the actual mining, right? So the, the digging, you know, they, 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 the, the definitions like it's something extractive or it's processing, you know, they're, they're still afraid, you know, the, the, the anti-mining sentiment in America is, is still, you know, strong. Like politically, it's so mining still has a PR problem. How do we solve the mining PR problem? How do we get... Like the government's moving in in a decent direction, but Manchin's not wholly focused on EV raw materials. He's focused on getting pipelines built um, for natural gas and and, and methane and 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 coal re, you know re, re uh, you know, reuse. Um, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Like he he's pushing for, let's say. Permitting reform is not just mining reform. Getting a road built has permitting problems. Getting a solar farm or a wind farm built has, you know, has hurdles, right? So there's lots of projects, even 
offshore wind in rich communities in Nantucket have massive resistance because there's NIMBY everywhere, right, in, in, in America. So he is targeting fixing the, the NEPA rules, which are, I forget exactly what that stands for, but that's like the, the federal permitting, you know, guidelines, but, and also seeking, you know, to, to, to have a limited time limit on it. So it can't just go for four or five, six years, but it could be like one to two years. That's what happened under Trump, you know, a project Lithium America's Thacker Pass started their permitting process under Trump when Trump basically said, you know, one year, you know, from application to record of decision, um, you know, and that, but he did that by executive order. And then that, now that's been changed by executive order. So this is going to be a congressional act, I think, with, uh, with Manchin. We'll see, the devil's going to be in the details there, but how do we get faster permitting of mines in America? Like we need to come to Jesus moment, you know, with the, the, the pro EV and anti-mining need to kind of come together and say, Hey, we need this. And, and it's very possible. We just had a, um, you know, a, a, a panel discussion where one of the panelists was talking about the tour de France. He was watching like on the eighth day of the tour de France, you know, they're, they're, they're driving around right next to a, a mine, a huge open pit mine, right? So it's possible for mining and, and, and populations to coexist, um, you know, very, very nicely. You know, but we'll see where the politics go. But I think it is part of the U.S. Um, you know thought process that, like, hey, we have friendly countries like Canada and Australia who love mining. Maybe we can actually do the mining in those countries and do the processing over here. So I don't think it's a. That's why they have this discussion about America plus free trade agreement countries for the domestic content rules. You know, to to cross that the, the free trade agreement countries are not going to get loans, right? You know, American taxpayer dollars, for the most part, are not going to be funding mine development in foreign countries, except if it falls under the Defense Production Act under the, 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 the Pentagon, but that's a lot smaller money. Um, but the, the, the how we get, I, I, I don't know, I'm hopeful that the momentum of you know, dialogue. They've shown that they can put in, you know, these subsidies, and we've gotten. This is a climate bill that, that the Inflation Reduction Act was was a climate like the climate lobby um, is, is very enthusiastic. There's all sorts of green energy, um, you know, programs which are going to get funded from this. And there's an increasing understanding that that energy transition is going to be very heavy metal intensive, right? And we can't rely on China. We can't rely on Russia. There's an understanding of CHIPS Act and the, the pandemic. And so we just have to translate that into uh, an appreciation that mining can be done. These are clean energy metals, right? They need, there's a branding exercise, a PR exercise that needs to happen for mining. You know, everyone associates mining with coal mining, right? Oh, coal's dirty, right? But there's plenty of mines which are it's the fundamental building block. You can't have anything without mining and people need to recognize that and it needs to be done and can be done in a sustainable way in America. And America has rich resources. We have big, you know, lots of land uh, and there are places where we can get this done. And it and it's a good employer. It should be a natural democratic constituency, you know, to have mine workers and chemical workers. Right? This is a these are not white collar jobs. These are blue collar. You know, Joe, Joe Biden should be supporting, um, you know, people who lose jobs in coal mines. It shouldn't just be kind of, you know, cleaning up the coal mines or, or you know, uh, cleaning up the, 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 the oil or capping the oil. But maybe you redirect some coal miners and become lithium and nickel miners. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think part of the other thing as well, Sean, is... Um... If we accept that it's unequivocally that EVs are going to be a lot lower footprint than internal combustion engine vehicles, and you look at it from a global perspective, that even if a mine is not, you know, carbon neutral or carbon free, but having those chemicals or having the necessary raw materials to make the EV, which is still going to be far more efficient than internal combustion engine, 
you know, is a lot higher in China or elsewhere, you have to at some point take a logic as to what's best for the world in total. Because if you're just going to say no and keep saying no in your backyard, it's like the saying, you know, if a tree falls and no one hears it, did it really fall or whatever? If it's made in China, does that carbon not really exist? Does the CO2 not really exist because it wasn't in your backyard? Therefore, it doesn't count. So at some point in time, you've got to look at the greater good here. And the greater good is definitely in a lot of instances in, in North America. So the question is, if you're going to make an omelette, you always have to break some eggs. So at, at what point do you say this is in all our best interests to pivot here, aside from the jobs, aside from the geopolitical issues that go with it, as you said, energy independence effectively or clean energy independence. You know, this is, you know, this is ultimately the best, but it's, it seems to be something that, you know, it's like, you know, um, wind power and, you know, there's some birds affected or this, it's a, it's a very difficult, it, it it becomes an emotive issue, but at some point in time, people have to look at it in a more logical manner and say, what's in all our best interests here? And do we want to be beholden? If you think about, you know, America always talks about oil, but the truth is, if you look at import and export, it's a netting effect, but you still import a lot of oil from some interesting places. Yeah, and there are some ethical challenges with some of those places that that Ford oil comes from. I think it's also important to consider what's the alternative if, if people pump the brakes on this transition to uh, new energy, what's the alternative? We continue to do what we're doing, which is uh, 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 effectively subsidizing uh, governments and, and, and practices that don't represent American values. As well, we become, we, we, we continue this dependence on an energy source that is consumed every time you turn the ignition or, you know, punch the ignition button on an internal combustion engine car. The raw materials get mined once and those raw materials are not consumed in an electric vehicle. And on top of that, and, and so you're getting hundreds of thousands of miles out of this fuel. Once it does reach the end of its life, that battery pack then gets recycled where 90 to 95% of the raw materials are recovered, processed and put back into new cells. So I, I like, when we think about the alternative, the alternative is far worse in terms of environmental impact than investing in, in localized energy and, and reducing the emissions long term. Long term, I just think that this is a way better option for so many reasons. The thing, I guess, is if you look at something like oil and you look at how far and how long those industries have been established in certain areas, they're well entrenched. So there's, as much as there's some pushback, it's, it's historically, you know, found its way. It's, it's now trying to, do, to, to get permitted and to go into new areas for new things under a different, a different era, you know, many years later. So that is, you know, it's not like the Texas oil industry or what have you, where, you know, that's, that's, uh, very strongly, uh, you know, defended. So, ultimately, yes, you've 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 earmarked it. You know, um, do you want to keep importing and having most of the world's um, clean clean energy or battery materials processed in China? Is that what you want? You've got to decide because if you don't want that, you're going to have to break some eggs. Yeah, I agree. I'm curious, Howard, to get your opinion on at what point does Tesla start acquiring some of these processing plants and mining companies? Does that, will that ever make sense? He's kind of tiptoed around that, but to date he's, Tesla has just done 
uh, agreements and partnerships with these companies. Will it ever make sense for, for them to just gobble them up and have more control over that process? hundred percent makes sense. The question, when does he do it? Um, you know, maybe after this whole like Twitter fiasco, like goes away. Um, you know, I see, I see he put another letter in today based on this uh, whistleblower report. So, um, he, he, um, he gets easily distracted. Um, you know, Dogecoin last year, um, and, uh, Twitter this year, he's talking a lot about the bots, you know, and the like, I, I think there's a, he can do a lot. I mean, he's he's a political animal. I don't know where he sits with this administration otherwise. So like there's all it's hard to predict. But I, I, I see he's now if he's promoting nuclear, he's, he's mentioning oil and gas. He, he's lending his he has credibility as being the most sustainable company in the world. Right. If anybody can kind of change the PR attitude toward mining, you know, it could it could be him even though Tesla doesn't do great PR for their company, um, you know, they just let the product speak for themselves. I think if um, you rightly point out, you mine these things once, but you do need to have a lot of this, you know, mined once, you know, in lots of different places, uh, you know, for 20 or 30 years. And to Rodney's point, he's very right. The oil industry is very entrenched. When it, it was not entrenched, and it was a new growth, uh, you know, oil boom industry. Every no one was complaining about ESG and pollution, and they were like, okay, these are great jobs, and so they weren't fearful of change. What what you what you have now, apart from NIMBY, is just people don't want to change, and 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 a lot of the places where there are raw materials in America. Um, even if they're not well populated areas, there's, you know, someone loves a flower or a farmer, you know, lives out West because he's a rancher and he doesn't want to be surrounded by people. So like you're, you're kind of promoting, look at all the jobs it's going to create, look at all the industry. And you're just like, well, no, I, I moved away from the big city to be over here because I don't want that. Right. So, and they don't want to change. Okay. But, and they only think for themselves. They don't think about like their, um, you know, their grandchildren, let, let's say, right? Like, um, so uh, the, the, it's a blanket statement to say that, but but a lot of the people who, who, you know, like how things are and don't want to change are, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, 70s. Um, but this is a this is a growth industry. It can be done very cleanly. These are very important jobs and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not super like low tech. This isn't dirty mining. Like the like people talk, you know, the, the anti mining is like, Oh, look at all these problems of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Right. Okay. But technology is advanced in every industry. And, and the, the, the way that mines are built these days is, 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 is much more friendly and, and will be, there's all sorts of things that need to be done. You know, electric trucks, um, and uh you know and solar and and every part of the flow sheet can be thought of you know you talk about scope one two three emissions that's being applied very significantly in the mining industry no matter what you can't give up the fact that if something's in the ground that needs to be dug up you're going to have to you know dig a hole right but the same is true of real estate if you see oh there's a beautiful plot of land that's now been rezoned to you know how many condo communities you know have been put up Right. And, and it didn't go so well. And then, you know, there's lots of um, there's lots of real estate, you know, and and, 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 and and the like, which are blights on the landscape that are not particularly like, you know, you, you don't like them. Right. So it's not like all develop that type of development is it's allowed. It's OK. It's, it's good. Like mining is OK. Actually, and after you mine Piedmont, you know, I, I noticed this as well. Once all the lithium is gone in 20 or 30 years. OK, you replant and reclaim and, and, and you know, there are, will be parks. And so if, if you think about it as a 50 or 60 year old who's saying, oh, I don't want to disrupt my life. But your grandkids, you know, who are born today, you know, when they're 30 uh, or 20, 30 will have the benefit you know, of that hole in the ground will be refilled and uh, it'll be a park. But there'll be all this industry and all these jobs, you know, created in your county 
that um, is, is a huge benefit, right? You know, to, 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 you know, hundreds and thousands of people, not just, you know, let's say 50 families, you know, who don't want to change. We'll start wrapping up. Um, what, what, what does the next 12 to 24 months look like for the electric vehicle industry, do you think, in terms of raw materials? Uh, what do you see happening? You know, I, I kind of tease the idea of Tesla purchasing up uh, companies that, that are tied to raw materials. To me, that seems like the, the next natural step for, for Tesla. What happens in the next 12 to 24 months, Howard? I think you're going to have like Volkswagen in, in uh, Canada last week said that they will start to finance mines, but they're also creating a separate power company. Right. So I think uh, maybe I didn't answer your question directly on should Tesla do this? I mean, Tesla could do it. Um, they're kind of relying on some intermediaries to some degree. But, um, it, you, you know, it, I think Volkswagen wants this buffer between their brand, right? Like they, they, they're, they're very fearful. Like if there's a mine disaster, what is it going to do to VW's brand, right? So, but if they, if they finance a mine through the power company, then it's not directly tied to the VW brand. So I think Volkswagen's going to do that. I think you're going to see big mining, you know, come into the sector much more. So BHP, Rio Tinto are going to spend many more dollars here. I think you're going to see big oil companies. They're starting to dip their toe, but there's going to be, you know, more of that. I think some of the battery companies, some of the Tesla suppliers, but look, Tesla's getting into the lithium hydroxide business. They're getting into the cathode business. Will they get into mining? Um, you know, I hope so. I think they can do it. Um, and, and, and they would have a long-term sustainable competitive advantage if they, if they did do it. Um, and uh, it wouldn't, you know, there are plenty of companies they could acquire with Tesla shares that, that would be, you know, be very happy to, you know, they're very liquid, you know, their, their shares are equivalent to cash. Um, and they don't have to acquire the whole companies, they could just partner and, you know, for five or 10 years and, and just help fund the mines. But if it doesn't happen, there's a real risk. And we've talked about this, that the 50% per year EV growth that Tesla is forecasting will not be met because you know if there's a, a shortage of lithium or nickel, and that's a real risk. And to the extent that Wall Street is believing in the EV sales statistics of the 50% growth, um, they may not attain it. Might they make their earnings otherwise through FSD, you know, or or bots or? this investment tax credit that I talked to, uh, you know, they, they may be able to meet their bottom line, but they're, they're at real risk of not being able to sell all the vehicles that they expect to in 24, 25, 26, unless much more investment is happening yeah, in the raw I, I materials. Mean, this, is, this is really a fundamental, uh, fundamental piece of, of Tesla or any other automotive company selling more units. You can't sell more units if you haven't secured the raw materials. The raw materials is really the linchpin of, of electric vehicle growth. So to me, it makes tons of sense. I, I, I also think that if Tesla has more skin in the game in terms of acquisition of, of raw material companies, it also gives them more incentive to flex their massive political power behind the scenes to to expedite those uh, uh, licenses and 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 to to shape the policies that uh, will directly benefit them. I mean, at the moment, the partnerships are one thing, but if I if if, if Tesla starts making some investments into these companies, uh, minority stakes or majority stakes, Tesla then has much more skin in the game for their policy team to then lobby for for shorter time periods of, of, uh, uh, of, of licenses and permitting. I, I, I think that the more that I process this, especially after this Inflation Reduction Act, the more that it makes sense that this will be Tesla's next step. I hope so. Um, we'll, 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 we'll see. Um, I, I agree with you. If he puts his mind to it and, and, and wait to it, 
um, political weight to it. He, he could have some great influence, but you know, he's, he's injecting himself into Twitter and there's political, I mean, he's in my perception and I'm a, I'm a, I'm an Elon Musk fan, but you know, his, his brand, um, in certain segments has, you know, decreased, you know, politically based on some of the, um, you know, actions he's taken, ex Tesla actions. I'd like to say one more thing as a prediction. I think I've, I've, I've said like the, the semi, right? If you really want to reduce carbon, okay, and, and toward the, the, a more sustainable future, uh, and Elon Musk has said like it's much more profitable to sell Model S's with the nickel than it is to, you know, the semis, okay? But uh, if you focused on the semis, you'd be reducing a lot more carbon because these are the most polluting vehicles. So there is a $40,000 incentive for semi-like vehicles uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act. So in addition to him making the cyber trucks, I, I, I predict and hope that, you know, maybe he'll start more mass production of, of semis. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very excited. And I think that this could accelerate their their semi-truck production ambitions um they've been delayed for a very long time i think it was back in 2018 when they initially revealed the the, the semi-truck so i'm i'm hopeful about that i'm ho also hopeful about and i'm going to do a, a a standalone video on this but it seems like stationary storage is is now becoming an incentive as a part of this uh IRA, this is Inflation Reduction Act. So Tesla stands to benefit significantly from, from the policies uh, in this act. So uh, more to come for certain. Howard, Rodney, thank you so much for joining the channel. If people want to connect with you, how do they do that? Well, I'm on Twitter, at Lithium Ion Bull and at Lithium Ion Rocks. I'm on LinkedIn. Visit Rockstock channel on YouTube. Um, and uh, rkequity.com is our website and you can uh, subscribe and you'll get access to our newsletter. So there's a lot of ways to follow me and Rodney, you can give your details. Yeah, I'm at uh, Rodney Hooper 13. And as Howard said, probably best on the RK Equity website. A lot of our material is up there. And of course the Rockstock channel, we would uh, encourage people to subscribe so they get all the latest stuff because we cover a lot of this and the companies, um, you know, within the sector. F fundamentally, Sean, if I'll just say the last thing, I watched, uh, you know, Tesla and you and you on YouTube, you know, they were like at 40, 50 billion market cap and then they went to a trillion. And what we're trying to do, you know, and what we represent, you know, but in Rockstock channel, like all the YouTubers who were right about Tesla, we're talking about it for five years. You're finally proved right. We've been proved right substantially, but our companies tend to be 25, 50 million when we start with them. And then they turn into billion dollar unicorns, right? And it's not just one company, it's a multitude, but more than anything, we believe the upstream raw materials is a place where you can make a lot of money, you know, as a retail investor, as an institutional investor, it's not a well understood market and rodney and me have been doing this for a long time and we're a very you know high integrity high quality filter of you know we do represent a number of these companies we do disclaim we do represent piedmont we do represent talon you know but we've had three companies of our clients you know sign deal with tesla a number of others are signing with some of the other auto companies and um it's just a a it, 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 we have, you know, four and a half thousand subscribers, you know, it's a very niche, <laughs> you know, place, but we, we expect that this is going to grow substantially, especially because it now has a very big tailwind of U.S. government support. And um, we, we encourage you to do more videos like this and and uh, and some of your peers uh, to pay attention to this opportunity and also risk, you know, to the the the, the Tesla um investment theme. Yeah, this is not uh, yeah, a thesis. this is not a clear highway. This is not a clear path to electrification. There's a lot of obstacles and a lot of things that have to be removed and you know, we we we've, we've talked uh, in in detail in depth a lot of this uh, conversation about the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there's just a lot of things that need to come into place in order to reach those electrification goals. Uh, but uh, I think it's I, I think that the the reward 
the objective here is well worth the the struggle, uh, the the investment dollars. Um, and I think that if if you've made it this far as a viewer of this video, and you. And it, 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 it's, it's a very long conversation, but I think it's well worth it because if, if you're an investor in Tesla or you're an investor in any electric vehicle company or any automotive company that's, that's putting emphasis on, on electric vehicles, this is a fundamental part. As I said, it's a linchpin of selling more units of, of cleaner air, of you know, be better environment. These things really matter and to understand where companies like Tesla are headed is important uh, because there's 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 just a lot of work to be done, and these are there are risks associated with uh, this this process. And to be informed and educated on this, I think, is doing your due diligence as as an investor of whatever company that you believe in, whether that's Tesla or Rivian or Ford or anyone else. These things matter. So. Uh, on that note, let's wrap up. Thank you, Howard and Rodney, for joining and having this conversation. It was really insightful and education, educational. Um, thanks for watching as well. So this is Sean from All Things EV, and we're going to sign off for now. Catch you on the next video.